Um, it's a live case from here at Mount Sinai. So uh, the Shaw and Company. Um, we were just wondering in, on the panel uh, how many people it does take to do an ISR case. Uh, apparently, it's very complicated. So walk <laughs> us through that. All right. Thank you, Josh. Right, you thank you for joining <laughs> us. Thank you, uh, PK, for the opportunity to do a live case frame from Sinai. So I'm just going to quickly introduce the team. Next to me is Raman Sharma. He's the assistant director of endovascular here at Mount Sinai. Next to him is Karthik Buja. Uh, Guja. He is the director of endovascular South NASA. Next to him is our new, one of the two endovascular fellows, Harsh Toshi. He's here joining us. You must have seen him yesterday as well. We have our nurses right here, Mark and Risa, and we have our tech right here, Freddie. And we have a very special guest here, uh, world-renowned interventional cardiologist, structuralist with a newfound love for endovascular, uh, Dr. Kinney. So just to, she just wanted to join us, say hello, All and be right. a part of this fantastic NYEVS. So we're happy to have her on board. All right, All right, so we're going to quickly start the case. All right, uh, Harsh, do you want to present the uh, history? Absolutely. Thanks for joining us. Can we get the PowerPoint up, please? Great. So today we'll be talking about a case which is basically an instant CTO and how we approach this disease with our IVIS guidance. Next. So we have a 78-year-old female, uh, history of bilateral lifestyle-limiting claudication, progressive to ischemic rest pain, Rutherford grade 2, category 4, despite guideline-directed medical therapy and supervised exercise therapy. Of note, you know, she has had a history of PAD about two years ago at an outside hospital. They placed a supera stent as well as a zilver stent in the right SFA um, due to native vessel disease. And she has a history of kissing stents in the iliac artery at the outside hospital. So this was referred to us by an outside hospital. She's on Xeralto, Plavix, um, and all the guideline-directed medical therapy, as you can see above. Next, please. So on non-invasive diagnostics, um, as you can see, we got an ultrasound and ABIs at rest, and we do ABIs at exercise on a lot of our patients. That showed a significant drop, and you can see that there's concern that the uh, SFA stent is now totally occluded. Um, and now, from there, we'll go to our diagnostic angiography. Right, so we did a diagnostic angiography. We got the left axis right here. Uh, for the sake of time, we took an iliac angiogram. Like Harsh talked about, the patient has kissing stents in the iliac. There's a little bit of disease in the right common iliac, as you can see, which we did a pullback gradient and it was negative. So we just went up and over uh, with our regular uh, up and over stuff. But we had a little bit of difficulty because uh, of the sheath and the angulation and with that lesion as well. So here we did the balloon uh, uh, sheath technique where we actually took a 6-0 balloon and we tracked our sheet over the balloon inflation, and as the balloon deflated, we tracked it over it for smoother transition so that there was no destruction or no change in the architecture of the iliac stents. So we had an eight French sheet because we were thinking of ISR and probably doing Rotarex, which Dan Hahn had talked about earlier and the people on the panel in the session here talking about different modalities of how to read ISR, and our goal was to get a uh, use Rotarex in this case, and that's why we decided on an eight French system. So we did have a little bit of challenge, but eventually, Everything is placed. You can see the angiogram right here, a robust profunda, but the SFA is occluded right at the ostium, just at what we call it the edge instant restenosis. Patient, uh, and it reconstitutes distally right at the popliteal segment, almost as like the P1 into P2 segment, uh, which is after the end of the stent. So there is some de novo lesion as well, or new atherosclerotic lesion after the stent. For below the knee vessel runout, the patient has a robust anterior tibial and peroneal. The PT is occluded. So essentially one and one and a half vessel runout. We're going to see some disease in the peroneal, but the AT is nice, which is supplying the, uh, the foot. And this is a picture of the feet. Yeah, so this is the one vessel that essentially is going down, giving the collaterals and giving the branches to the uh, plantar arch as well. So the idea was try, trying to see how we can manage this uh, instant uh, restenosis. So based on the strategy, we did a little bit of offline work where we did our roadmap just trying to define the anatomy. I can uh, show you a MAGDAP just to give you a little bit of more idea of where the instant restenosis is. You can see it's right at the edge of the proximal stand where it starts. And distally, just to give you again an idea where it uh, really uh, reconstitutes why a significant collateral is right at the uh, popliteal segment in the adductor canal. <laughs> yeah. So the idea was try to cross online. We had a microcatheter wire technique. So we got a microcatheter 
Down there, there's an 035 uh, trailblazer we used, trying to pop it, uh, fish around and try to pop it, trying to make sure we are still in the stand because the wire would 10 times comes to go behind the stand. So we were able to get into the stent, and with our 035 uh, stiff wire, we actually traversed all the way down till the end of the stand. But then what started to happen was, well, while Raman was trying to wire, it was just going into false lumen just after the stent, so he decided to change it into an 018 wire system to try to find the lumen. So we, we used uh, 018 stiff wire, and then eventually, with some navigation, we were able to successfully cross uh, distally into the normal uh, distal segment or the P1 segment uh, into the distal SFA right there. So after this, uh, we've already crossed. So being, uh, being in from an academic standpoint, we just obviously wanted to see what's the etiology, what's the morphology, and what, what constituted the ISR, what so was the whole significant ISR. You have an yeah, so Vishal, uh, before oh, and you... and then we, of course, you put a filter. Go ahead. Yeah, so before, before you, everything's great. Before you uh, go on, I think there's some points that may be worth talking about. Um, number one, you went eight French, so you must have had something in mind. So are you just going eight French in case you want to use a variety of different devices and you don't limit yourself? Or what was the thought process on eight French? Correct. So uh, the idea was to be aggressive enough in dealing with this long segment ISR, trying to be aggressive enough in debulking the lesion. So certain devices, you know, I mean, either it's the most of the times as of now for ISR, we're using Rotarex, which is an atherectomy and an aspiration thrombectomy device if it's a lot of thrombus or laser. So if you want to use like a 2-2 laser, which in this case probably will be appropriate, we at least need a seven French system. And in order to visualize which uh, with a seven French or an eight French device in, we had to have a little bit more lumen so we can visualize at the same time we are working. So that's why we chose an eight French system. I know it sounds a little bit aggressive, but I guess in this case, eight French was definitely warranted. We had a discussion with, uh, between the three of us and I think uh, we, and also the groin was not bad on the left side, the axis side, so that also facilitated or made our decision easier of doing an eight French. Yeah, so we, we, have a, uh, we have a very esteemed panel, and we'll, we'll, we'll ask what everyone's strategy was. I think the other point to make, um, now they, there's a little bit of protection with the stents, but I think that when you go eight French and you had the difficulty that you had, you know, there's a lot of tension on that system, so when you come out with that, how, are you planning to come out sort of protected with a, you know, so you're not dragging along the aortic like bifurcation because that obviously can lead to some bad complications every once in a while. Right, now we agree. So usually what we try to do is we want to give the sheath the body to it. So we keep our stiff 035 wire, we reintroduce the dilator. So at least the, uh, the sheath has some body to it and then we slowly pull back. Of course, keeping in mind that we're not going to cause any damage, elongation or crushing of the edge of the stent. If you really look at the iliac casing, it's not, it, it does have a little bit of room right at the ostium, so it's not really, studs are not really protruding into each other, which gives a little bit more flexibility. But we were, like I said, we were very careful in going up and over. I think we are confident enough that we'll be, uh, we'll be okay by the time we get done. I think the main thing was, George, I, th I don't think we took it for support's sake. We basically, there was a lot of wire bias into the stents. We uh -huh. just right. wanted to take the bias, bias out. That's why we used the balloon. Balloon to track. For us to track it. Gotcha. All right, we have, uh, we have uh, Drs. Coombe, Mattisari, Matthews, and Zeller, uh, and Wiley. So uh, what, what do we, uh, anyone have any thoughts on how they would approach it? I mean, obviously it's an ISR, so there's some data behind some therapies and not so much others. What do you think, Jay? So, um, you know, so I noticed that once you pop through that proximal cap, it looks like the wire crossed relatively easily. So. One thing that I would do, instead of trying to go through that channel beyond the stent, is to actually treat the stent first and then cross using the stents as its own filter. Um, so that way, if there is, because my, my concern is that there's, there's a big soft core of hibernating thrombus, a really soft plaque that could embolize, you know, possibly the Rotorex will take care of some of that. I, you know, uh, I myself, and I think Kumar sometimes too as well, likes to, we, we'll, we'll do a thrombectomy of that first before we treat. Uh, and I think that removes a lot of that stuff that could potentially cause complications as well. I see you put the filter down, so I, I think that's a, that's a great uh, great plan. But one option, like I said, is instead of having to do that up front, is you can just treat the stent. And then once you're ready to cross at the very end, then you pop through uh, after you've treated the pr proximal. Yeah. yeah, hey guys, this is Kumar. I think having you three in one case scares the hell out of me, but. 
Um, I think eight French for Rotorex makes sense if that's what you use. I agree with George's question about the iliac stents. That makes me always concerned about when you're putting things through there and coming back. But uh, the good thing I think you, I think this shows in the, in your cap that you showed above the stents is that you're going to have to do something to that proximal SFA because that's going to be a recurrent problem. And whatever you do today, if we don't aggressively treat that SFA osteal origin with something, including maybe atherectomy, mm -hmm. it's going to be a, a problem and you may need to, to, to rely on that. But I agree with Jay, if your wire went easily through those full metal jacket area, then sometimes I'll consider uh, some aspiration first, but you know, no data to that. I think the most important part of this uh, uh, procedure is that they had placed already a distal embolic protection. Uh, regardless whether the uh, wire flies down or it does not, having a filter and a long segment uh, ISR is important. Otherwise, you pay for it dearly. Do, do we have any information on why the stent went down? And do we have um, with the superiors, because this is an out of hospital with the superiors well deployed, um, you know, could you give us some idea based on fluoroscopy if there yeah. was uh, invagination of the superior? Uh, yeah, we, we, we so can we were it. just going to talk to you about it. We actually did an IBIS with Karthik and Raman can talk about. We can show you on fluoroscopy. I mean, the IBIS probably will give you a better in-depth uh, uh, idea of what, what the etiology might be. And that's why uh, we did an IBIS run. If you can focus on the IBIS, please. But we can do a quick run for you, Raman. Well, while you're, do, while you're the, doing that, uh, while you're doing that, let me get let me get Professor Zeller's opinion, go. and then we'll uh, and then we'll yeah. go. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well, basically, in my institution, uh, instant occlusion is treated in 100% of the cases with Rotorex. We are doing this since 2000, so 24 years now. Perfect stuff. And um, every year we are performing between 500 and 600 Rotorex procedures, so it's really a workhorse wow. device. And I've never used a no. filter, to be honest, wow. because um, if you are doing it carefully, if you advance the Rotorex step by step, I personally have not seen a distal embolization, in particular in instant reocclusion so far, in a couple of thousand cases. So it's, it's not a real problem. If you would do laser, of course, I would use a filter, because sometimes if you are going too fast, you're pushing the thrombus away, but with Rotorex, you um, successfully remove all clot material usually. And, and Thomas, is this because you're only using Correct. the Rotorex for Tosaka tree? Um, I mean, in the diffuse instant, you won't use the Rotorex or you would still use it? We use it exclusively in total occlusions. Right. Yeah. So, because with total occlusions, um, there's an automatic protection at the bottom. And hence, the, we don't use a filter because <coughs> you think? No, yeah, not, not essentially. Basically, the, the aspiration capacity of the Rotrex is so high. You have seen probably during the um, lunch session, uh, if you have not enough inflow into the artery around the catheter, the vessel, including the, the stent, does collapse. So if you can result in, in vessel collapse, there can't be any distal embolization because if you have material which is potentially embolic, it will be removed by the, by the uh, device itself. So it's, it's really a, pr a very safe uh, device regarding uh, distal embolization. It's, it's a, and it's and a for the users who have used um, yeah. the Rotorex with a filter over a 14 wire, um, of course, uh, my understanding is off-label because, yeah. you know, have you had a problem with the wire fracture because, I mean, uh, I've had a fracture with the V18 wire on occasion, not yeah. so common in a long case. I'm just wondering what's the experience here in the US if you use a filter in a 14 wire. Yeah, I've, I've definitely had problems with it where there's also separation of it uh, when you use it with the different wires. Yeah. Yeah. So what, why don't you guys walk us through the, uh, the IVUS, see if we can figure yeah. out a failure. But just a quick question for Dr. Zeller. Yeah, just a quick question, Dr. Zeller. Does the IVUS and the thrombotic burden ever change his decision for putting a filter in. I know he said he's never put it in, but let's say with IVAS, we prove that the thrombotic burden is significant. That also doesn't drive, or that doesn't also warrant putting a filter in, or we still do what we do, which is straight up Rotorex and hope that nothing goes down. So Rotorex was initially developed as a pure thrombectomy system. It was never um, designed for azorectomy purposes. And uh, in fact, it does perform some uh, kind of azorectomy at least in the range of the outer dimension of the device itself. So it sucks also solid material into the 
site holes and removes organized material. But um, the initial idea of the invention was to remove thrombus, and this is extremely effective. So it does result in a, in a negative pressure of um, um, about 30 millibar. So it's, it's, it's really effective. Yeah. And um, if, if you have an instant occlusion, the majority of the lesion length is composed of thrombus. You have usually a focal near intima hyperplasia area which re results in the occlusion. So it's a minority which is composed of near intima, the majority of thrombus. And this is why it's the good indication for Rotorex primarily. How fast are you using it? Yeah. You recommend it? Uh, <coughs> yeah, speed you, have, you can go step by step. Not as, as slow as recommended for laser, but you shouldn't go stuck in, in a couple of seconds, 30 centimeters. Take your time and you will remove all thrombus easily without distal embolization. All right, guys. Okay. Walk us through the IVIS. Yeah, so right. we did right. an IVIS and Karthik is going to talk about the IVIS. So we pulled it from the pop wherever the reconstitution is and uh, you can see uh, the vessel size in the pop is uh, pretty small. It's about 4.5 to 5 and then um, you see all the, um, the, uh, the plaque and everything in the, the native plaque. The na oh. This is all neoatherosclerosis as from what the information we have um, just after the stent and as soon as we come into the stent, we see some uh, neointimal hyperplasia and instant restenosis right at the edge of the stent. And then, as uh, Jay predicted, it looks mostly thrombotic uh, in between the proximal and the distal lesion. Basically, everything else within the stent seems more thrombotic. Some intimal hyperplasia right here. So we anticipated this area to be uh, having some uh, near intimal hyperplasia and instant restenosis, and we'll show why based on angiography. That would uh, answer Steve's question. Um, so everything else except that. There are three spots, the proximal, the mid, and the distal spot. It's all instant restenosis. Everything else other than that, between these three lesions, everything seems more thrombotic. Yeah, but the supera and all the stent, as you can see, it looks very well deployed. deployed. There's no obvious sign of fracture so, or anything. Yep. Yeah, the only sign so, that we do see is just at this one segment one of the segment. overlap. Yep. Which if we can show the actual angiogram, it's so, a notable uh, point. So once we come after this, I'll show you exactly how the stent sizes are. So. If you see, this is the supera stent size. Seems to be deployed pretty fine. Looks like a 5.5 five supera. Diameter right. seems 5.2. Um, and then this is the 6.0 silver PTX, which they put, seems 5.7. So it seems pretty OK. And if uh, Raman is going to go to the uh, one before this. Floor of Raman. Yeah. Raman. You can floor Raman. Just floor Raman. Yeah, you see this. So you see this part, uh, where the overlap of the stents is, that's the midpoint where there's a lot of restenosis. It's no like overlap. when they deployed the stents, they must have probably yeah. missed, missed it. Just by a uh, millimeter by or two. A, like a millimeter or so, looks like. Uh, or probably they deployed the supera, or they deployed the silver, and then deployed the supera when they ballooned it. Probably the supera just springed no. on itself, moved on itself, and slide. They, they, the two stents basically slid over each other, and there is a mal deployment there. That's where you see another restenotic area. Kartik, if you do have right, a chance so to do so a flexion, and it would be really interesting to see if the separation of those stents on flexion, I'm not sure if it's a hmm. appropriate that right now, right. if the wire in the filter is in, but I mean, just on plain fluoroscopy to see if there's actually a kink or an so association of the stent in the area. Steve, would you see that even if it's in the middle of the thigh? This looks like it's a mid thigh. Yeah, it's not in the popliteal It's not in the popliteal yeah. zone. This is actually like a uh, in area. the upper right thigh. Right in the, the middle. Knee is down over here, and yeah. this is actually quite quite higher up. You still see it? Or? Um, no, I have absolutely no idea. I haven't really treated many of these <laughs> instant occlusions. <laughs> this kind of I'm, I'm really wondering. <laughs> um, <laughs> I really thought you knew the answer. <laughs> so, yeah, so in this case, we decided to do a rotarax, being like Dr. Zella talked about, using both the athrectomy, but mainly the throm aspiration thrombus back me part and because we had an eight French in, in we had the liberty of using an eight French rotor rex and like as predicted because of the significant suction of the device which we can show you the we were able to go do the proximal edge but as and how then Raman went almost in the mid this it would literally get stuck and the stent would essentially collapse on the on the device itself and it would stop it was pretty much like stalling and you can so see it I, here yeah the stent kind of just Sucking into the actual. So we did uh, the, like I said, pecking in, out, slow. But again, it 
here, look at that. Look at how the stent really collapses on you. And yeah. you can hear the machine really essentially it's stall. Right. Yeah. So if then at that time, we decided that, yeah. If, if you see ahead, that, Dr. then um, the next step would be to predilate um, the entrance into the stent because you need to create flow around the catheter. Otherwise, you create vacuum and this results in the collapse. If you dilate simply with a short balloon, five millimeter, six millimeter balloon, you will never see a stent collapse like that. Right, okay. So yeah, so, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So yeah, so eventually then we decided we're gonna give it one more shot, see how it behaves. And then like you after said, maybe, the dilatation. Yeah, after the dilatation, that's exactly, and then And we did the same thing. And it's, it still seems to do the same, same yeah, thing. Yeah, it kept doing the same thing, right? I mean, we had a little bit of progression, but not at that significant at five. So at that time, we just decided to technically downsize ourselves and come to a six French rotor X, which hopefully, we're gonna start right now, we're just waiting for the response. Hopefully it would, might give us a little bit more purchase and not stall and not cause all the issues which it might. But the PTA, like you rightly said, we try to do that as well, but it, it would not still work. So we, I have a question for the panel. I, I, knowing that it's a six, it's a six-o stand. Yeah. Um, would you guys think like eight, uh, the, uh, the, um, the eight millimeter rotor X is eight French rotor X is a little bit too aggressive for a six, six-o oh. stand, or would you guys just go with a six French? Dr. Zeller? Uh, yeah, well, eight French is not too aggressive, but six French would be uh, big enough in sizing um, in order to remove the thrombus right. in a small vessel like this. Um, that would have been my first choice. But anyhow, if you predilate now the, uh, the origin of the SFA, you will be able to cross also through the supera stand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're gonna give it one more shot to see if we did predilate. Hopefully this, like you rightly said, this responds a little bit more better. We you can know, actually see, see how you... Vishal, it also may be Raman's forearm compressing the stent. <laughs> <laughs> totally, <laughs> totally proud. That's, that's, that's the first thing we said. Raman missed his protein bar this morning. So the no, I did not. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but, right. So but, the idea was, would anybody have chosen laser by any chance in this case? Yes. Based yes. on the yes. IVS, the finding, the presentation? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, with all that soft, so after you've sucked oh, off the soft too many core, yeses. Yeah, you, you know, you have this rind of fibrotic uh, plaque there. And, you know, like a, a, for me, if we had a 2 3 turbo power laser, I would just ablate the whole thing and melt all that tissue away. I mean, I think laser would have been okay here too because you have uh, atherosclerotic disease below the stent that you're going to treat and at the origin of the osteum. So if that's truly. I kind of personally just prefer to use that to have multimodality treatment. But I guess the, the other thing is the, the difference between the devices and the size of the devices, how important is it to really massively debulk and then do your final treatment? Let's just assume that they've decided that ideally they would use a DCB. Yeah, so that. how important is it to massively debulk versus debulk it enough? Or is anyone thinking to reline it? I mean, there's data to reline yeah. it with covered stent. I mean, you know, there's there's other options. So I guess, do you think about that ahead of time? Yeah, I mean, to me, it's if you can clear out whatever's in there, clear it out because whatever you leave behind is an impediment to full expansion of what you're doing. Yeah. So you want to talk if you're going to leave a lot of hyperplasia yeah. behind or even yeah. thrombus, yeah. then you. you may be inciting okay. another problem. Okay. So yeah, if you can debug. Because the curious thing is you're not going to expand the supera. Yeah, but get you want to get back to the wall-to-wall yeah. yeah. -wall yeah. of the, the <laughs> PTX or whatever the other stent is there as well. Right, I guess just to not to interrupt, but just for the audience, just one of the learning points which they teach you with Rotaracts, and I'm sure everybody in the yeah. panel would agree, is that pecking motion of going back and forth. Usually with other devices, other orbital or rotational, we have a habit of just going down in and out. But in this case, going back and forth, pecking device is what's recommended. I think it's probably just to add both the aspiration and the atherectomy part to it and so that it functions well. Yeah. But also in, on the back end, make sure you keep on squeezing that little uh, tubing because it seemed as though at about seven or eight, you were getting some more um, you know, change in, in, the, um, in the drive speed. Yeah. So whenever so that happens, try to make sure that, you know, as Dr. Zeller was we saying, that has get a free, good, free uh, flowing blood. Back on. Yeah. And also, as you see here, the 6 -so is responding well. I mean, the stalling is not really happening, and it's going down relatively smoother. So hopefully it's doing its part, and we'll take picture after this and decide how well it went. Get a pre-dilatation. You can hear them. Get a pre-dilatation balloon. 
Can you hear them? We can't hear them. Right? We can't hear them. Are they talking? Five Armada. Five, 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 five Armada. What, what, what we're still, we're still here, guys. So when you guys started, uh, when you saw no, the you Legion and you saw this, uh, what, were, what was your guys already oh, planning for definitive five, treatment, Michelle? Yeah, so we, we discussed among them, Southern, like you rightly said, the proximal part needs definitely a little bit more aggressive therapy. So we were thinking of just using a drug eluding stent in the proximal part. Distally, our goal was to do a drug coated balloon. We're going to do a drug coated of the entire stent anyways. But the distal, the new de novo lesion, we plan to do a drug coated balloon and see how it responds. And if we have to, only then extend the stent down into the popliteal. The idea is try to keep that vessel as scaffold free or as stent free as possible. Let's say future bypass if this fails long stent, which everybody knows the chances are definitely higher, uh -huh. then we should probably have a option yeah, of doing a old. surgical bypass versus ready, so whatever, right? yeah. detour, Keep whatever bypass, uh, people like to do based on the indication. And uh, for the middle segment is the real question I have for the audience. How do you treat that so-called missed segment or the almost zero overlap? What's the thought process on that? Oh, yeah. I, mean, I, would tr I would put a little shorty stent right there. Right at that missed overlap section, yeah, right? Yeah, overlap, yeah. Six. It's going to be a notice or failure again. Yeah, and I, th and I, and, and yeah. I think I, I'm, I'm not oh. totally sure that on the day of deployment it was missed overlap. You know, we all know that if the super is a little bit elongated, yes. it will find yeah. itself. Yes. Yeah. And it, so it may, it may have pulled away yeah. from, the, from the Zilver versus yeah. a miss. You want to go yeah. forward or go back? Yeah. Good. I'll pull back a little bit. That's good. George, were you the outside hospital? <laughs> yeah, a, a, a question for everyone up there. You know, this was a, uh, you know, it's a failed and long segment. Would anybody on the panel consider up front a PQ bypass? PTAP. Yeah. Detour. Let's, I mean, we can, we can get some opinions. I, I think most everyone uh, would not do that right off the bat, but. I mean, I think here you, you found an anatomical issue in a couple areas, and this is the first time you're trying to reopen it. It lasted three years um, from, from, from the history, so I don't know if you've proven that this is not going to buy you some more a couple years if yeah, it's it. looking a little bit better at the end. How much proximal landing zone do you have on the top? Um, because, you know, if you don't have sufficient proximal landing zone, running a PQ could be a problem in terms of you know, that's been one of the modes of failure. Um, and screen yeah. failures for for the trial. Yeah, it, well. would, it would only be within the actual stent, and there was about almost just like a centimeter and a half of the native vessel, approximately, just before the uh, profunda and SFA bifurcation. Yeah. So, there so would hey, have why don't you guys? Portion, it would definitely have to be within the, the stent. Why don't you guys continue you to work and let's get around? let's at least get one talk going, just so we uh, stay somewhere Judge within you. the area code of on time. Is that is that okay? Sure. Sure. Yeah, that's fine. I was just going to show you a quick picture after the Rotarex okay. to really show you if the Rotarex, really, the six French, how it works. And then you guys can go over by the time we do some other therapy. I fear so that you will have no outflow. Huh? Huh? This. Oh, that, well, I'm, I'm <laughs> well, <laughs> Let's see, Dr. Zeller. Your experience, see. of course, is definitely appreciated. So. Okay. Uh, it's coming, it's coming. <laughs> There's still, still yeah. something. <laughs> Motion. Now is the money shot. It's not zero. <laughs> yeah, it's not zero, you're right. Not zero. It's yeah. like Timmy half flow. <laughs> exactly. Again, we did not uh, we did not go into the native vessel to do that, so I think uh, once you balloon that native vessel, we might get our... Local. Why not? So, yeah, so... Yeah. We're not Why not? Yeah, well, we'll we'll be we'll pay attention and we'll be back yes. uh, after this yes. next talk. Perfect. So, uh, should we get should we get an update? See what uh, yeah. see what's going yeah. on. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, George, so yeah. uh, let me show you just as a recap. This was the picture after the rotarex thrombectomy, um, and like Dr. Zeller predicted, not much like outflow. Some lines. flow, if you see, almost at the end. Here it comes, but not as uh, impressive as it should be. So because we had not touched the real distal edge where the new lesion was, we actually prepped it with a 5-0 balloon. We went up there. The size was 4447 distally. And then we decided to do the DCB of the whole segment LR. distally with a 5-0 long DCB and then proximally right there. But this is just purely after just doing the uh, prep of the lesion distally. Now you can see inline straight flow going down faster than your collaterals, which is a good sign. And also you can see the filter is open and the, all the other branches are open. So we did a long uh, 6-0 DCBs in the stent as we wanted to do 5-0 distally. 
trying to make, trying to see if we can say putting a stent distally, and on, because we approximately anyways for the ostium, we, we were thinking of doing the stent as well. So before we're just finished at DCB, so we're gonna run a quick IVAS and then I'm gonna show you an angiogram of how it looks. And then we can decide on uh, the uh, next, uh, now the definitive therapy uh, on how to go about it. So this is our IVAS, like you see, all the way down distal into the popliteal segment. So we're gonna start pulling back. Yeah, all right, let's go start, record. So we're gonna pull back. You can see, of course, there's plaque and a little bit of dissection right there. The vessel looks actually a little bit more better, the, uh, the larger in size after the 5.0. We could probably have gone 6.0, but the vessel showed 4.7. And now we are in the stent uh, after a DCB. I mean, not much. The thrombus looks pretty much resolved in a way or absorbed, whatever you want to call it, or aspirated. Uh, not much uh, atherosclerotic, uh, new atherosclerosis as well. And we're just going to focus on that junction which we talked about, uh, which, uh, which was right there. But overall, as you can see, the stent definitely looks uh, much more, uh, much better uh, after this intervention. Okay. And this is the real spot, right which here. probably is also causing trouble. Here you can see uh, the lesion is still there and there is some narrowing for sure. The rest of the uh, night nose self-expanding stent looks good. And then proximally, we're well, gonna come up just before the stent where, where the regional right uh, lesion was. And there you can see it's right at the ostium uh, of the CFA. So I'm gonna quickly show you pictures and then I'll ask the panel of what's their thought process on how to treat these so-called three segments. We already did the main ISR, hopefully that got fixed, but right. the origin, the middle segment, which we showed on IVAS and distally as well. So let's do a quick, uh, but any comments on the IVAS per se? We'll give you a quick pictures right now. Go, Go for it. Ready? Did it, anything surprising on the IVAS? It actually looked not too bad. Mm -hmm. Very good. Seven for fourteen. And that's the proximal looks good. The distally again. You can see it's much better flow. I think the distal segment looks very good after the DCB. Still a little flat. Yeah, there's the one. There's the one dissected area, but I think once yeah. you start, uh, I think I once you start chasing those things around, you could end up in, in a second, much worse six, position. Six, I don't know. What's your legs? Exactly. Flow. Mm -hmm. So for the panel, I guess, asking everyone, what would their next uh, step be? I mean, I'm going to show you in the last shot of the pop the deal. Another view of that so-called dissection or know, looks that haziness. So, so but Professor I probably, uh, Zeller, what, what's the next step for you here? If you uh, aggressively post-dilate an instant occlusion, that during this dilatation process, you mobilize some, some embolic particles going downstream. And I, I have the impression that the filter has captured some of these emboli. Yes, I don't know if you heard the whole thing because of the microphone, but, uh, but uh, Dr. Zeller was saying, take the filter out and then see what the flow is really like, just to make sure that it's not being inhibited by debris. Let's do non -DSA. Okay, I'm good. Would you take an aspiration yeah. catheter Let's down to the filter? Well, we have that ready. I'm going to show you a quick non-subtracted image of the filter just to give us a better idea like what Dr. Zoller is talking about. But we do have uh, aspiration catheter penumbra here uh, ready in case we need it. So, yeah. So you can see there's a little bit of uh, uh, goober there. <laughs> but I don't know if that's more <laughs> that impressive as you would think. You would I mean, it looks more like spasm. Correct. Yeah. That's why. Okay. It looks more like uh, Jose, what, what would you do next? Yeah, I think we Yeah, so I'm un uncomfortable with yeah. uh, whatever is inside of that uh, filter. I would uh, put another uh, Wario Advance a, uh, a aspiration catheter. Yeah. I'll take out the back. Okay. But what about the thought process on fixing that middle segment? I, I think do we do most, another Zilber, do we do another short supera? I think most of us were saying another stent. Now the stent choice, we didn't really decide on. Who, who, DES or? Yeah, I, I would supera? just put a short six DES. Yeah, yeah DES. Yeah. Short six DES no, seems to be the consensus. Six or 60. For both Four. mid and the proximal segments? The overlap part. Yeah, yeah, and then approximately, I think, yeah, yeah. approximately, I think you, uh, whatever so size you got on IVUS, you put a DS. Yeah. 
DES there. At the Ostium? Yeah. I mean, yeah, that Ostium one, might be, that one yeah, definitely probably more straightforward. DES, not us at Paris. Unless you're coming first. from the other direction. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. 640. 660 first. Six, which one? Middle first. Middle, middle first. Just a question for the panel. Uh, you know, in coronaries, we know that when you land a stent and that the distal edge has a plaque burden of 50% or greater, the risk of restenosis is higher. So in this case, I did see that the distal edge of the stent had a decent amount of plaque burden. Would anybody use that criteria? Would you use a hemodynamic gradient to assess if you need to treat the distal edge of the stent? I think it's not, it's not a bad idea, though, but my original thought is that you may start your way down a path you don't want to go down, you know, because there's some, exactly. there's some problem areas yeah. by IVUS, you already know. You see angiographic evidence of a, of a non-flow limiting dissection. If you start to overthink it, you may find yourself extending the metal, yeah. and then then you start to then you get into the whole argument of what is this person's options down the road? Have you just taken away yeah. one of them? And so this might be a place where you may not want to know <laughs> all of the information. <laughs> uh, another question for yeah, the I panel. Think less is more. Uh, just yeah. uh, uh, you know, so you've already DCB'd this. And now you're going to put in a, a, a drug-coated uh, stent, I'm assuming, in the middle area. Is there any uh, danger to yeah. drug dose uh, if you use uh, double uh, at the level of uh, upper lesion? A little more. A little more. The amount of drug involved is pretty low, uh, relatively speaking. 40. I mean, we talk about paclitaxel doses. I think patients get repeat interventions over and over and over and over again. I think there is a small risk of getting to, like, you know, chemotherapeutic doses, I suppose. But... In this case, I think the amount of drug is still relatively small. Well, um, we did a randomized study besides the FAIR study uh, evaluating okay. DCB over plain balloon angioplasty. The Coba Cabana trial, um, the other one. Dr. Taper did publish the data. And in case of re so meaning recurrent instant re uh, we did use two overlapping DCB, huh? that means number. double dose. And um, interestingly, in these lesions treated with a double dose DCB, Good we had seen no recurrent restenosis okay. within one year. So it seems that there may be a beneficial effect if you implant a, a drug eluting stent on top of a DCB. Can I get a yeah. six or eight? So, so Tom, like the other, the other question is, below. in this kind of lesion, why not just realign it with a, with a, with a uh, Viabon? The problem is the small diameter of the of the supera stent, and if you add now a stent graft, which adds another layer of, um, of graft material, you further reduce the Armada. true lumen. So uh, to stay with the smallest stent uh, diameter uh, or um, um, profile would be my first choice if I would implant Good. something. Yeah. No, I think you had only a uh, single black. vessel runoff, so I would feel oh, uncomfortable perfect. putting a, uh, a Viabon stent. Nice. Makes sense. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think the patient came in with perfect. kind of progressive symptoms rather than an acute limb, so yeah. I would just rather, I would hate to, for that to be the presentation next time. <laughs> All right, so Close. like we did, we, we did put in uh, two dragolinian stents, one in the mid segment, 6060. Uh, Zilber, and we put a 6040 approximately to cover the ostium. And what are you going to do with so, the filter uh, now? We would, so we're going to, we, I think uh, we're comfortable enough to take the filter out as a regular, without the aspiration uh, uh, help. We're just going to do it the regular way of uh, taking the filter out. So a little partial capture. Yeah, with a partial capture, correct. Okay, so we're going to let Kumar give his talk, and then we're going to, and then we'll check back in yeah, with you guys we'll right now. Yeah, come for the final yes. pictures. All right, Vishal, what's the final uh, picture look like? Pictures after our DCB at the distal end and two stents proximally and distally. Uh, so you can actually see, let me show you the shot. So this is our this picture is from distal to prox. Hold on. Proximal distal. Oh, Sorry. right. So that's the stent placed in right there, beautifully placed right at the ostium by Karthik and Raman. And you can see very good blood flow going down. The expansion uh, of the stents is right up there. And then distally, which was the main concern for the thrombus and everything, we have good blood flow all the way down. Like George was talking about, we don't want to start chasing our own tail, we end up in more trouble. But I think the flow uh, distally right there, right there was good, and that's the AT going down. 
uh, all the way to the foot with excellent uh, reconstitution back, the complete arch. So I think we did achieve good enough flow all the way down for a rest pain, a uh, pain lady who's presenting with significant ISR, and the lesions we identified, hopefully we treated to the best of our uh, technology available. And I think this should definitely help her in the long run. Of course, we're gonna follow up in clinic, make sure uh, she does well, and hopefully we don't have a recurrence. And if we do, then we have to talk about other options like you talked about, whether it's a true surgical bypass or a detour like Kumar was talking about as other set alternate strategies. But any comments from the panel will be highly appreciated. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say something first. I'm, I'm glad to see that you did a completion angiography, especially into the foot, to, to really define things, because it's a little ill-defined uh, because of all the disease at first. So you want to make sure that, especially in a lesion like this, it has such a high degree of uh, possibility of embolization. It's very important to see that your final you know, product is good. Um, Jay, any final thoughts? We'll just go down the line. No, I mean, I, I think <laughs> this is a tough patient, right? So anything that we do is going to be really challenging. The, and the runoff is problematic, but I think this is the best option we got right now, too. I agree. If we had put a long covered stent in, you know, I think this could have turned into an ALI situation down the road. So I think this is probably the best solution we have right now. Uh, great job, guys. You guys, despite all odds, you guys did a fantastic job, and it looks great. Any comments on uh, you, anticoagulation and antithrombotic therapy in these patients? This is a patient so, I would not do So on. it's interesting, she came in on the exact therapies we heard yeah, about this morning. That's what I'm asking. Lot, would right? would I you would, change anything? I would, I would keep the same. I would have, a, I would have an antithrombotic and an antiplatelet or two for sure. Yeah. And I wouldn't do the Voyager uh, PAD dosing. I mean, I would, I would Properly do, anticoagulate? I, I would yeah. give her full anticoagulation. Hmm. Because I, I, I found that I've tried for how long? Never, you know? For how long? <laughs> Forever. <laughs> the full anticoagulation. I mean, we're using Forever. it like for like. Do you give it for a month, two months, or it just no, I, I leave as if you're treating your? Yeah. Because the other wow. thing too is when it goes down, also it's a little bit easier to deal with as well too because uh, the thrombus is, is still fairly liquid and you can actually I, I've noticed operatively it's just an easier uh, a clot to manage. So what's, what's full uh, anti You wouldn't consider doing uh, aspirin, Plavix, and Xarelto, because she no. came in only on uh, Plavix and, and Xarelto 2.5. No, so I would do Plavix and full dose Xarelto, Plavix and full dose Eliquis. I would drop the aspirin. Okay. Great. There's not a lot of data with aspirin anyway, too. It just seems to increase the risk of, you know, uh, of bleeding. So I think most bleeding. of the benefit antiplatelet-wise will come from the Plavix and then, of course, the antithrombotic. Yeah. Well, may, I, may I question you? Uh, f full anticoagulation. Well, um, if you consider the times of um, um, Mark Kumar in in uh, in US, it's uh, what was the old anticoagulant? Acumadin. Acumadin. Okay, yeah. exactly. Full anticoagulation was INR three plus somewhat. Yeah. So if we are talking today about full anticoagulation using DOEX, then it's. Uh, equivalent to INR2 to 2.5. So the question is, what is full anticoagulation today? That's a good uh, I, I don't think that uh, Azeralta 2.5 VID is sufficient. So maybe it's something in between, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think, but I think, uh, but I think uh, Dr. Bach showed a, showed a great 15. couple slides on dual antiplatelet therapy and uh, antithrombotic, and it, and, it, and it really did make a difference. Now, um, and it, t as to the best of my knowledge, I think that was, it was uh, kind of on a permanent basis. I don't think it was just for a few months. I think the data he showed it had at least one year. Uh, so that was something that was interesting to see this morning was the profound effect of the getting both, you know, true and anti-thrombin type therapy and antiplatelet therapy. The issue oh. becomes, of course, then the bleeding risk, right? So, yeah, absolutely. And, and so while that would be the ideal scenario, the problem is a lot of these patients just can't tolerate that, which is why people have also come up with these half-dose regimens as well, too, like Xeralto 10. And uh, so I, I don't, you know, we don't, we just don't have a lot of data, I think, to support that strategy. So, so I, I have a question, um, just for the, for the panel, because I think it's a great case. So you've all, you know, I mean, they've uh, done a Rotorax and this D DCB. What, what's going to, what's your next step when this fails? Well, I think, I think you have to entertain the thought of, of bypass at some point. So, so what's your algorithm? How many ISR failures do you have or do you have in your mind 
that you say, okay, after one or two, or is it two or three, or three or four, or never? So I've, I've got, so I'll answer the type of ISR. I've, I've done repeat uh, procedures on people who tend to come back and they've just got a couple focal areas. So I don't mind working on a couple focal areas, but if the whole thing is down again, and the whole thing is down the time after that, then at some point you gotta think about something else. Well, Seems to be an issue with the mic. You can't really hear. And yeah. Okay. So, but but the question is, I mean, none of these. This patient wasn't followed for three years, right? So we don't know what had happened in that three years and what was the intimate time. So, how often would you follow her, and how would you surveil her? Jose. You know, they, these are the patients that I like to follow up one month, three months, six months, and every year. It's my uh, usual protocol. A lot of these patients with this are going to come back earlier if they're feeling it because they're pretty good about knowing their symptoms, so I'm less worried about it. But I think surveillance, like Jose said, is critical. So I think especially in this patient who had rest pain, and uh, you know when the SFA goes down, you're dealing with a patient potentially that's going into an acute scenario. So if you follow this patient up and you see a focal stenosis, I think that's reasonable to treat that focal stenosis. So for me, uh, if the patient continues to smoke, I'm definitely not doing a bypass on this patient because that's going to fail. So uh, those are the things that I would actually consider. And I'm still a little bit uncomfortable with the separation of the stent. <laughs> so if, um, um, and maybe with an Illuvia or uh, with a Zilva right now, we've taken away that, that issue. So, um, yeah. So my Regarding a dual antiplatelet therapy, uh, we know that uh, the addition of uh, Plavix uh, to aspirin, uh, charisma showed that there really wasn't that much of a benefit. Uh, Euclid didn't show that Ticagrelor alone uh, was not beneficial either. But recently, I think it was in April or May, Themis uh, trial was uh, 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 showed his data that showed that there's a decrease in uh, vascular events with the addition of Ticagrelor to aspirin. Yeah. Would anyone consider that? Yeah, I mean, the, the, only, the only issue I have with Ticagrelor is then you start to get into the reality of patient care, which is if you look at all of the primary care data, as soon as you take someone and you go from Q-Day to BID to TID, your compliance goes into the toilet. That's always the main concern. And then cost. A lot of patients I take care of can't afford all that stuff. So, it's, so somewhere along the line, you got to spend your money on like the Entresto because that's very important and maybe you sacrifice Tychiric for, pla for Plavix. I mean, that's a, that's, a, it's a di that's a difficult deal because the data is very clear about the medicines, but the reality is a different story. I have a question for fellow surgeons out there. I mean, we have a scenario here where you see there's some lesions distal and around the distal SFA and P1. Um, would you put a vein graft on a previously drugged distal SFA and P1? Are you happy to stay above the knee or do you want to go below the knee? And maybe you like to, I'm just curious what others would do. Yeah. You know, I think that's a great question. I think I've learned the hard way that when you're doing a bypass, you want to go from healthy to healthy. So I've tried to do bypasses to areas that I've treated before endo with a DCB that don't look terrible, but they're not perfect and they've had treatments before and they have you know, had early failures. So I think if you're going from healthy to healthy, you'll have a much long-term durability. That being said, the other caveat is now you're turning a fem above knee pop bypass into a fem below knee pop, pop bypass, which we know does worse. So if you don't have vein, then I would consider uh, maybe trying to go above knee and, you know, not burning that bridge. So I think it depends on those two factors. Yeah, I think personally, I think um, I'm quite happy. I mean, if you don't have a healthy um, SFA, I'm quite happy to stay. I prefer to stay above the knee and do drug-coated balloons or pluck out stents uh, on the distal side rather than go below the knee with a prosthetic or something along those lines. So I think personally, I like, I'll like i sacrifice landing on a normal vessel but stay above the knee with a nice vein graft and accept that I might have to re reintervene distal to that vein graft with balloon angioplasty. No, I agree. Yeah. Especially if you have a patient that's going to follow up and you can do close surveillance, I think that's, you know, perfectly a good reason. All right. So, uh, 
The Shaw and Company, great job, great case. Uh, we'll let you get the patient off the table. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining.